As I got another rhyme, another rhythm for y'all to listen I'm never quitting on my mission, I'ma roll with what I'm giving Got some ambition, this new addition, filling positions Looking at the void in myself and feeling what's missing Better watch the way you going, better go in the right direction In the moment you stressing, but you gon' be counting blessings And I know that for certain, keep on working, open curtains Haters swerving, cause they ain't ready for your final version Whoa. You're listening to the Sound Fitness Show on WNHHLP 103.5 FM. Your home. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning, Harry, to you. My uh, guest this morning is John Pittard. Uh, John is the uh, Associate Professor of Philosophy of Religion at Yale Divinity School. And I guess I wanted to share a little information about uh, Professor Pittard because we were chatting before we went on air about this. Some people might see this show to be a radical shift from the last five or six years of, of uh, oh, social commentary and other, and other matters. But uh, it, it's important uh, from my standpoint in terms of 2023 to kind of look at, we can look at current events, i.e. Ukraine, or we could look at uh, what, what's happened in, in, Me- in Memphis a few days ago, or we could look at the continual presence of uh, of Donald Trump and and just uh, discussions about unity in in America and in the world for that matter. But it seems to me that some of these ancient questions, these issues that that mankind, humankind has have been dealing with for the last uh, several millenniums, people are concerned. They're, they, we're wondering about the future of society, the future of our species, whether we're going to even be around. I mean, as I talked to, uh, I was asking Professor Pitter where, where he was, whether whether he was in the Bahamas, but today we would normally have snow on the ground, you know, or, or, or 30 or 40 degrees, and not to mention we can see climate change. So make a long story short, uh, Professor John Pitter is with us, Associate Professor of Philosophy and Religion, and the title of the show is, is uh, I mean, hold your breath, Artificial Intelligence, Philosophy, and Religion, Artificial Intelligence, Philosophy, and Religion. Um, Professor Paterda has has uh, written on this topic in, an article in the, in the Reflections magazine in the Yale Divinity School, and that's what prompted my attention to kind of reach out to him and to kind of kick off 23 with uh, let's kind of sometimes sit back, but also move forward in terms of our 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 our, our, our intentions and our desires and our and our aspirations and our thoughts. Uh, uh, I am going to give Professor Pitter a chance to speak. I believe it or not, I mean, we have 55 minutes, but I'm going to give him a chance to open open up his mouth in a few seconds. Like, but just wanted to mention that he had, uh, secured his obtained and earned his undergraduate degree from Harvard, secured an MDIT, Master's of Divinity from the Princeton Theological Seminary, and his doctorate from Yale University. Uh, good morning, Dr. Pitter. Good morning. It's great to be with you, Tom. Let, let, let's jump in, and we have fifty-five or so minutes. Um, and I got to tell you that I'm, I'm, I'm. My ESP tells me that I might, might want to impose upon you to kind of come back in a few months or in the fall, just so we can follow up on this topic because this topic is not going to, mm-hmm. not going to go away. Uh, and for, you know, perhaps we could talk about just that, the, the, the title, the artificial intelligence, philosophy, and religion. Where's the, 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 the intersection between those? Uh, social constructs? Yeah, great question. So um, philosophy for millennia, as you suggested, has grappled with questions about what makes a human person a human person? How does the mind relate to the body? How does the mind relate to the world that we're engaged in? Um, Questions like what uh, is free will? Do human beings have free will? Mm. What makes for moral responsibility? And these questions, while enduring, I mean, to to a degree, they they can somewhat be set aside, I think, by uh, kind of average person in the street who's not that interested in them. Uh, they're not usually explicitly engaged in a philosophical way in religious communities. Uh, but one thing I'm suggesting in the article that you mentioned is that with the advent of artificial intelligence, and particularly uh, with the likely developments that artificial intelligence will take where it gets harder and harder to differentiate between uh, human intelligence and machine abilities. Uh, these questions aren't going to be ones that are merely theoretical. We're going to have mm-hmm. a host of practical questions that we have to answer um, about what sort of role we give to artificial intelligence in our lives, in our family, maybe even in our churches or other religious communities. Um, 
And the answers aren't obvious. So I think philosophy, you're forced to do philosophy, but philosophy is <laughs> hard and the questions are enduring for a reason. Uh, they're mm -hmm. enduring in part because they're not easily settled typically by scientific experiment or something like that. So uh, these questions are going to be uh, disruptive, I think, to a certain degree, maybe to a great degree to, to religious communities as they grapple with the status of artificial intelligence. So that that's how these things kind of come together. Um, we Obviously, there's a lot to unpack there, uh, but that's why these three appear on the same list. Indeed. So let's continue the un unpacking, and I'm going to, I'll share the link to the Reflections article. What, what I do, Professor Paterger, is I'll send out um, the, the, the link to the show, and I'll include kind of some notes, and I'll include the Re Reflections article in there. Well, what prompted you to uh, had that been kind of resonating in your mind to write that Reflections article for the last few months? Had you heard anecdotes? I was curious what, what kind of stimulated your thinking in that regard. Yeah, so um, so I'm a philosopher, which is an interesting position to be at at Yale Divinity School. Um, certainly there are many here who are interested in philosophy, but it's not, no one's required to take philosophy if you're getting your Master of Divinity degree, which is uh, the kind of degree that a lot of people get here training for ministry. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a sense in which it's an interesting location at Yale Divinity School. I'm not at the heart of theological education by any means, um, but there was this issue coming out in reflections on the future of theological education. Mm -hmm. Yale's, so Yale Divinity is celebrating a bicentennial, it's 200th yeah. anniversary, and there was a special issue of reflections, and the editor of that now online magazine um, emailed me and just said, you know, do you have any... Ray Waddle, uh, do you have any, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, views on the future of theological education? My initial instinct was, uh, you know, I occupy this kind of marginal uh, space. Oh, I'm really? not at the yeah. center of theological education. I don't have any views on that. You know, I love philosophy. I'd love for philosophy to continue to be part of theological education. But um, certainly I have in my own teaching some on science and religion and just in my own reading and thinking been thinking about artificial intelligence. And then I, I began to think, well, what role might philosophy have in the future mm -hmm. of theological education? And um, as I began to think about all these difficult questions that are coming down the road, really, we need to be grappling with them now. Um, occurred to me, well, maybe philosophy will have to be um, <laughs> yes. less marginal, if not central, at least uh, something that is unavoidable and mm -hmm. theological education in the future, precisely because of these questions. And uh, so it's certainly not the only set of gripping, difficult questions we have as we think about social justice issues, climate issues, but it's one that's perhaps going to be, in my mind, as significant as many of the other pressing concerns, and uh, one that, if we're not careful, will catch us off guard, you know, as theologically-minded thinkers. So, And say, say a little, I appreciate your sharing that. Say a little bit more about being caught off guard or deconstruction or elimination. I mean, off guard is a casual way of saying, but that we might be on. I'm, I'm curious about if you think how close we are to the precipice of uh, mm -hmm. make, make, making mistakes. And then also may perhaps reference in the article that you raised the issue of whether uh, sentient, if, if a certain creation can, or invention can be sentient. But talk to us about yeah. what you think we're on that precipice. Yes. So then the follow-up question would be precipice of, of what? So, indeed, uh, indeed. I'm kind and, of leading you on, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So um, here is uh, one, of, one of the worries or one of the questions uh, that I think will come up is, um, you know, I assume most of your leaders are familiar somewhat with artificial intelligence, but uh, recently it's it's been in the news uh again, with a recent um, iteration of some of these AI chatbots. So these are AI that you can interact with. And um, there's a company, OpenAI, that had developed uh, GPT-3 was uh, up until recently, its most recent iteration. You could get online and ask it questions and give it prompts and interact with it. And it would generate text that uh, sounds like it could be written by an intelligent person. And then the most recent iteration of this is chat GPT, which again, anyone can use if you go onto OpenAI's website and register. And um, and so, you know, as you've perhaps read in the news, or maybe uh, some, some people have interacted with this website themselves, you know, you can 
ask it to write a poem in a certain style. You can ask yes. it to write an essay on a certain prompt, specify the style, specify some of the points maybe that you want it to make, where it can make its own points and come up with arguments and ideas. And um, and so one question is, um, when these sorts of tools begin to appear, your human began to do many of the things that we take ourselves to be uniquely positioned to do as human beings. Um, what sort of role should that have in our lives and our communities? And what sort of spiritual significance, if any, yeah. does it have? Does it actually mm -hmm. have a mind? And we can talk about the question of consciousness in, in a moment. But so one precipice that we might be on is a point where um, where it, it, I don't think we're that far away. Maybe we're still a little bit far off uh, or not quite there, but where um, these technologies can begin to do um, many things that we do, that we yes. take to be the, the creative enterprise of a human being, say writing music, writing worship music, thinking about religious mm -hmm. communities, writing mm -hmm. a sermon, you know, mm -hmm. engaging in pastoral care, just engaging in a conversation about scripture, asking questions about that, participating in a um, a Bible study or the study of the Quran or whatever, you know, there's going to be some point that I don't think is too far off where these chatbots can uh, do many of these things in a way that seems very, very human. Um, and so that's one, whether it is human is a separate philosophical question, but mm -hmm. when it seems that way, you know, many people are going to be thinking of it in human-like terms. And then we have these questions that we need to address as citizens of a country as members of a family and as members potentially of a religious community about the role for these technologies. And it, it's better to think in advance about mm -hmm. how to approach these questions rather than wait until the technology is already there. Um, and maybe there's a, maybe there's even some opportunity to shape some of these technologies. Uh, I'm not saying that we're actively developing, but be in conversation with um, governments and with businesses that are shaping these technologies and think about, um, what sorts of powers we do or don't want these technologies to have uh, before they have them. You know, I mean, there's a sense in which maybe this has an inertia and inevitability, but uh, maybe there's some opportunities for some shaping um, of the development of these as well. But if you, I was looking at your, appreciate that answer is very, it gets illuminates a lot and gives us a lot to kind of further unpack. I was, I was looking at your Vita and some of the courses you've taught over the years and what are you hearing from from your from your students? Because you, you're involved with the undergraduate community as well as the graduate community. I'm just curious, from an emotional level, are you sensing their any sense of their anxiety or their thrill or their excitement in terms of this new this new frontier? Yeah, you know, it'll be interesting to revisit some of the classes I've taught before after Chat GPT, after hmm. it's really been something that people can kind of see a, a powerful, even a flawed kind of. Um, example of this sort of technology. I think I'm thinking back the last time I taught science and religion and we talked some about um, some about artificial intelligence, about the possibilities of uh, human minds being, I mean, these are even much farther out than artificial intelligence, but yeah. uploaded into kind of a, a simulated computer space, some of these yeah. questions. And I, I think many students see this as a kind of unrealistic maybe somewhat uninteresting dream of a kind of techno utopians in silicon valley um and a sort of distant interesting but distant sort of sci-fi thing to think about um and uh maybe it's that maybe the barriers to really having to face these problems in an urgent way are are the, the technological barriers may be more surmountable than some think. So maybe we are going to have a fairly clear divide between human capabilities and machine abilities for some time. But but I I suspect that now the questions would have a little bit more urgency mm -hmm. than even when I say taught last taught my science and religion course a year mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. um, right now I'm just beginning a course on free will where we're grappling with questions about the nature of free will and. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether students are uncomfortable uh, with certain views of free will that might lend themselves to the idea that these artificial intelligent 
you know, entities could also be autonomous or free in some sense, you know, yeah, might they also yeah, have more yeah. responsibility, so. And, and whether they would be entitled to rights, et, et cetera, in terms of the legal, our, our future legal system. Yeah, uh, that that gets into very, if, so a central question to my mind, some philosophers might debate the centrality of this, but um, is whether these artificial friends, artificial beings, these chatbots, um, whether they could be conscious entities. So, mm -hmm. and it might be worth pausing on that term for a little bit sure, and just sure, kind of please. defining it because consciousness mm -hmm. can mean many, many things mm -hmm. to many people, but um, in the philosophical sense of consciousness, and sometimes it's called phenomenal consciousness, you know, to say that something is conscious is to say that, uh, there's something that it's like subjectively to to be that thing. There's something that it feels like. So it's not just outputting speech and behavior, but it has maybe an emotional life or feelings. It can feel um, excited by something. It can feel feel interested in something. Bored. Um, you know, these are all sorts of subjective states, and. A machine, of course, we could imagine saying, "Oh, it's great to see you," you know. But normally, if if Alexa in my kitchen, you know, we have Alexa and our kids ask it the weather, you know, right. she sometimes says, you know, nice to, good morning, John, nice to see you or something like that. You know, none of us really think Alexa feels happy or excited to right. see me. Um, but one question is, as machines become more sophisticated, as bots become more sophisticated, would they cross this line, this divide between sort of just unthinking speech outputting machine to an entity, a being that is conscious, for which there's feelings and a way of, of feeling in the world. And um, and to my mind, whether these bots have rights, whether they could possibly have spiritual significance, that's going to depend in large part on whether they could be conscious. And mm, um, mm. and uh, but this this just kind of surfaces this very difficult philosophical question about why anything is conscious you know mm. why why are some animals conscious why are human beings conscious why aren't we just complicated biological robots engaged in behavior and and speech but mm -hmm. not actually feeling anything and um this is a a deep question it's hard enough that one famous philosopher has called it the hard problem and the mm -hmm. philosophy of mind um mm -hmm. and this problem of really understanding why certain physical entities material entities like a human being um is conscious why why it has this subjective sensation and the very fact that it's hard that this isn't something that we can easily theorize about and understand i think is a warning because i think that um it's unlikely that we're going to have widespread agreement on whether mm -hmm. these machines are conscious and thus whether they're potentially we that we therefore may not have good agreement on whether they're morally or spiritually significant mm -hmm. um and uh, it's not clear that there'd be an easy way to tell you know i mean the machines yes, might yes. insist that they're conscious but someone might say oh that's just part of their programming right they're, they're just kind of engaging and they're mimicking human ways of speaking and of course we attest to our own consciousness so we would expect them to attest to their consciousness whether they're conscious or not um, but it's going to be very hard i think if you have someone who's in some sense becoming a good friend that you relate to this chat bot very much like you might relate to someone a human being on the phone and talk to them and they um, seem to represent themselves as having feelings and thoughts it's going to be hard for many to trust that they don't and maybe they shouldn't think that they don't have those but i think that's going to be a central question that's going to be socially very very significant and it worries me because i think that I don't think we really will be able to know at some point whether these mm -hmm. machines are conscious. And it's worrying to have a whole class of entities whose moral significance is uncertain to us. Um, there's risks that that poses to us. I really appreciate your be being as transparent as you as you have been thus far. And I'm sure that's why you and many students find your courses to be really, really insightful. I was you, you referenced, uh, I think it was Ray Waddell with it reflections and i was thinking about i think he interviewed you in terms of an article a few years ago the, the elusive thing called certainty the elusive yeah thing called certainty mm -hmm. it, that, that just kind of flashed in my mind as you were talking so maybe elaborate a little bit more on on that concept 
Yeah, that was a great title. I think that was his title for this interview that he did with me, um, I don't know, nine years ago or so. Um, well, you know, I think um, probably one reason I uh, became a philosopher is because um, I didn't feel certain on many questions that were urgently important to me, you know, whether those be especially religious questions. And, um, and I think while, you know, maybe while diving into philosophy has helped me come to firm views on some matters, um, it certainly hasn't answered some of these central mm. questions say, about mm. whether God exists, go to a question that we're talking about today, whether human beings say have free will or something like that. Um, these, um, and, and so one question, <clears throat> one ultimately grapples with in, in philosophy, if you don't find certainty, maybe some philosophers do, I haven't, um, is what to do with that uncertainty and how to live in light of it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I think that's something that was a theme of that interview that I had with yeah. Ray, which is, um, and there we were focused on kind of religion and re religious commitment. I'm a Christian. And, you know, what does it mean to kind of um, be uncertain about some of these core questions. Not to say I don't have opinions, not to say I don't have thoughts, considerations that speak in favor of certain views, but um, but they're certainly not settled and certain. And so, mm -hmm. um, like many, I have to make choices and live in light of that uncertainty. And maybe that's a good thing. You know, there are yeah. certain philosophers that would say it's precisely living in that face of uncertainty where there's a kind of human nobility um, to kind of cast your lot, not knowing. Um, on on one way you know without mm -hmm, knowing mm -hmm. where it leads um mm -hmm. precisely just just as you were talking to my my, my flash to this well earlier in this month of course we celebrated mlk and people quote him in so many variety of ways but i always like to think about his phrase of where do we go from here uh and even in terms of memphis recently i'm mm -hmm. people are they may not be phrasing it this way in their mind but where do we go go, go from here uh uh and as I mentioned, even like the Ukraine situation, uh, but but I was so, but but the point I'm trying to make is when I was looking at some of your background, and you you wrote a book in 2019 on this disagreement and deference and religious commitment, and it seems to me if you could weave in some of those thoughts, and whether you're is there no, is there part two of the book coming out? Have things changed since 2019? Are you more mm. committed to what mm. you said, or is there more disagreement, or is there more agreement? Yeah, so. Um... Yeah, that that book that I that came out in 2019 is on this question of uh, how does one navigate one's own beliefs and commitments and confidence levels in the face of disagreement with intelligent, informed people who hold very different views, um, and um, and this is a very big question right now in in my philosophy world and theory yes. of rationality um because it, it it sometimes can feel a little arbitrary or egotistical or something if you say well you know all these other smart people i know um many of them disagree with me of course some agree with me but you know it, it, you might think in kind of choosing a side and having a view um you're sort of assuming that you're in a better position to judge this matter than a lot of other people who come to different conclusions. And so many have thought this is kind of arbitrary and, um, you know, the, the reasonable thing to do is to uh, just be agnostic, to be uncertain, um, to when there is disagreement among really thoughtful and informed people to not take a side. Um, and, uh, and I think there's a lot of power to that argument. And I think sometimes probably that is the best thing to do. Um, but it's worrying, given that there's so much disagreement on some fundamental questions, even say about um, morality or religion or, um, you know, it's, it would be worrying if we were not able to um, ever reasonably hold a commitment on these topics. And so the, that book is grappling with this question of, are we really required to, does rationality or reasonability really require that we be deferential to kind of the wide scope of opinion and therefore 
find ourselves in some place of uncertainty on many of these urgently important questions. Um, I don't think we're always required to be uncertain. I think sometimes mm -hmm. it can be reasonable to um, put more confidence in one side of a position. And um, uh, so that book is really just, it's kind of a meta a meta question in a sense, because yes. a question that's at a higher level, I'm not really in that book. I'm not taking a stand on um, any core religious question. Does God exist? Does God not exist? It's more at this higher level question of, could it be reasonable to take a stand, you know? Mm, mm, um, mm. And, and arguing the conditions where it would be reasonable and when it wouldn't be, you know, when disagreement really should cause you to just say, I don't know, or maybe even agree with the majority who disagrees with you in some cases. Yeah. Um, or, but, um, you know, you asked about a follow-up. I mean, there's that, that question is gripping to me, this kind of, I called it a meta question, meaning I'm not yeah. really getting into the nitty gritty about what's true about the world, but more just this, you know, could it be reasonable to have a view about what's true about the world? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm sure I'll continue to do some philosoph philosophical work on that question. <laughs> I want to get it more in the nitty gritty, I think, in the future and and really take some stands about, you know, uh, some of these religious questions or philosophical questions about the nature of ultimate reality and um, sure. God and stuff like that. So, so uh, no, I don't think my next book will just be a kind of meta level philosophical follow up. I think it's going to be a bit more. Um, yeah, a bit more engaged in these uh, kind of first order questions, just taking a, a stand, so to speak, rather than asking whether it's reasonable to take a stand. And I've, I've already gone on record that once that the book comes out or the pre-release that we'll have you back on on the show. So okay. that, well, that, that, that was the invitation originally originally meant. Uh, uh, I, and I understand that you're not a political scientist, but it just my mind goes to as you were talking I mean, I'm sure you read you read the news, you listen to the news, you talk to people. But does any of your work or your beliefs or your your research uh, when you when you see Lindsey Graham, for example, today talking endorsing Trump again to run in 2024? And I'm not asking mm -hmm. whether you mm -hmm. how, how you voted, but I'm just curious whether you your your philosophical training and your education and your your being that when you read the the discord, the, the clear discord, and and I call it Civil War Part 20. That's going on in our public discourse. I just wonder whether whether you had any thoughts on that from a philosophical standpoint. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so the when it comes to my my field that I primarily work in is called epistemology. So it's a fancy word for study of um, knowledge and rationality. And you can think of that at an individual level, but you can also think of that at, at a social level, you know? So um, are we doing a good job in helping people? Are we, you know, this could be institutions, this could be schools, this could be um, our technologies and the way uh, people use them in helping people um, make reasonable, come to reasonable conclusions and responsible conclusions. Um, and I think that there's uh, lots of reason for concern at a minimum. I mean, uh, I think that the kind of um, silo effect of people getting their their news from very biased sources, and maybe they're biased even towards a correct perspective, but it's um, a one-sided kind of perspective, um, the kind of short rhetorical flourishes that are kind of for the course for a lot of the dialogue today that takes place on Twitter and Facebook and the like. I mean, this isn't, these aren't anything new, but I think there's a lot to be, I mean, this isn't my original thoughts, but I, I agree with many who think there's a lot to be concerned about the kind of social uh, epistemic landscape today. So having to do with <laughs> forming beliefs and knowledge in a reasonable way, I think it's, it's highly problematic. I mean, there's there's some benefits too to the kind of massive uh increase in information that's available you know i think that it leads to opportunities to maybe test question look for alternative perspectives that go against maybe some mainstream kind of opinions that would have been 
the only ones available if you were just going to classical news sources, your local newspaper, or, you know, um, TV evening news or something. But it's also a mess and it puts so much burden on the individual to try mm -hmm. to do justice to opposing mm -hmm. views and think carefully and responsibly and in respectful and humble conversation with others. And it's hard for anyone to do. Um, I mean, I, I think that it's it's easy to kind of just fall into the information sources that reinforce your opinions. And um, so I don't I don't know what to do about that. I mean, as a philosopher, I, I tend to work on a fairly theoretical level, thinking about the nature of evidence, the nature of reason, and and uh, but so these social concerns are are real, and mm -hmm. um, the level of emotional heat, villainization of the other side, I think, just reinforces certain biases, and um, and it's hard for me to not to fall into that myself. I mean, right. uh, I, things seem so split thing uh, other perspectives can seem so uh morally corrupt sometimes that it really is hard i think to have an attuned ear that listens for the best to be said on another side and um and so yeah uh, there's there's a lot of concern there for sure and that, that that's why i was attracted to your your most recent book in terms of the title and whether we can act rationally toward toward one another Let, let's jump for a second i was looking at your uh some of the courses you've you've taught, and it's really just so fascinating to see the titles. And one really just jumps out at me at, at the moment: the metaphysics and the uh, uh, epistemic self trust. And just, you you reference kind of personal self trust or societal self self trust. I want to chat a little bit about that. It seems to me that that's in tune with what you were just referring to. Yeah. Well, that. Um... That gets into some wild, wild ideas that are kind of this, right at the heart is, of my this, next project. But. This is well, you know, sneak, give me a peek. You know, I won't, yeah. I won't call up, but uh, get, te tease us a little bit. Yeah. Well, um, our um, there's a sense in which our knowledge of the world around us is mediated through our experiences, our yes. appearances. You know, so um, I can touch a water bottle, I feel it. That's how I know a water bottle's there. Or I, I see, you know, a dog walking down the street. Um, and, um, but I, there's a sense in which the dog isn't directly present to my mind. You know, I know it through my perceptual experiences. I know the past through memory experiences. And uh, so there's always been this sort of underlying question in philosophy um, that's just been challenged by certain skeptics over time, which is this question of um, uh, why be confident that we're really in touch with reality, you know, mm. that, um, and I don't know, there's lots of skeptical scenarios that might be put forth. How do you know the world isn't just five minutes old? And it was, you know, it came snapped into existence with dinosaur bones in the ground and misleading memories and, and history textbooks, or um, how do you know that you're not in some computer simulation of some future society that likes running, you know, simulations yeah. of um, people like you, Tom, and um, sure, the, the, the maybe you're not really in. interacting. Maybe I'm just part of the simulation. You're not really interacting with a human That's being right. here. So there, there's lots of questions like this. And, um, and some of these questions, I think, are taking on a new urgency with certain uh, developments in science and cosmology that actually highlight not just the possibility of certain sorts of deceived deceptions or mismatches between appearances and reality, but maybe even um, a certain probability or likelihood that the, that the world would contain these sorts of mismatches between appearances and reality. Mm -hmm. And so this qu class is getting into, you know, what do you do when cosmology or or uh, science, you know, kind of suggests these possibilities of mismatch between appearance and reality, and and uh, what sort of what sort of view of the world, if any, do you need to have in order to maintain confidence that you're not deceived in this way or radically out of touch with reality in yeah. some way? And uh, my my argument, my hunch is that is that. Um, to be confident in one's own and in, in one's appearances, one's memories, uh, one ultimately needs to think that um, the world isn't just this kind of random assortment of 
atoms that came to be by chance, but there has to be some kind of orientation towards goodness or towards purpose. Um, maybe because there's a God, maybe because there's some other way in which the world is ordered towards a purpose. But that's kind of my argument. And it's going mm -hmm. to be, you know, I've developed it some and published work, but it kind of the, the next book is that these, these skeptical worries about mismatch between appearances and reality are are real worries and they're made worse with certain cosmological and other developments in, in science, some in artificial intelligence, computer science, some mm -hmm. in, in, in the sciences and, and that we need to um, think hard about what sort of uh, world we believe in. And if, we, and if we're confident in our appearances and con then I, I think that it, a, a view that under that, a view that supports that confidence that makes it reasonable to be confident yes. would be one that sees the world as yeah, directed towards goodness in some way, um, mm. so that you'd have reason to be confident that there'd be a, a nice fit between appearances and reality. Um, mm -hmm. So that's very heady. Yeah, <laughs> it's that's very right. abstract. <laughs> I'm happy to explore well, well, anything I've said in greater well, detail, but <laughs> well, let, 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 let me let me just say we were talking before we went on air about some of my the future, my my vision for 23 in terms of the show's format and topics, and I will be chatting with a number of my Divinity School friends, as I, as I mentioned, I graduated in 75, uh, in terms of their religious experience, whether it was a dream or their, their religious, their conversion experience, or was it was a psychic thing? Was it a dream where they remember where they were? And so uh, share a little bit about your, your anchor in this regard, because you're, you're on record in terms of uh, your, your religious beliefs and share with our audience a little bit about your training and experience in that regard and your particular denomination. Yeah, well, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, going to uh, uh, Church of Christ, it was called. It's fairly kind of um, eh, conservative, evangelical type uh, denomination, at least in that part of the country. And and uh, so it really emphasized reading the Bible and um, taking uh, the words of Jesus and the words of Scripture seriously. Um, and, uh, you know, like many, um, I think that college and having setting out on my own was a time of wrestling through questions about whether this was reasonable. Did I just believe this stuff because I grew up where I grew up and had the parents I, I grew up with? And, um, you know, and um, as we sort of alluded to earlier with that uh, article, the, the elusive thing called certainty. Yes. Um, I think I came to a position where I felt, you know, um, not to say that this wrestling is over, I th it still happens, but yeah. uh, where I felt like there was enough that was compelling and beautiful in my faith to um, build my life on it, even though it wasn't obviously correct uh you know it's not that i have no uncertainty by any means um and um and that's that wasn't merely an intellectual thing you know you talked about religious experiences so i've i've certainly had some experiences in um say worship and church that are extremely moving experiences in prayer where i've i've had experiences where i, I felt like something uh it would be very hard to explain without uh, appealing to some sort of supernatural reality had happened. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess unlike some, I, you know, I don't just see, oh, okay, I guess, I guess then my faith is vindicated. You know, this happened in a Christian church. I guess that means Christianity is right or something. You know, I mean, if there's a God, that God could be big enough to work in all sorts of religious contexts, whether they have God right, you know, fully right or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but I think those experiences were did give me the conviction to um yeah to not be dismissive uh of of god of the supernatural of something that is well beyond what we're able to measure and understand with science mm -hmm. and scientific mm -hmm. instruments and ways of observing um and um and i think this this idea of uh relating to a a good and loving source of the world um, that has expectations of us to love one another. Um, I think it's a very meaningful, um, convicting, inspiring, and uh, 
yeah, purpose giving kind of way of life. Um, mm -hmm. So in that broad sense of, you know, I'm, I'm sort of heavily signed up on um, team, <laughs> you know, seek after goodness, seek after love. And in the hope that that's really fundamental, you know, that that's not just uh, some feeling that popped on the scene in latent human evolution or something like that, mm -hmm. but that uh, love is really behind things. So, and if you if you if you had shared that during one of your classes, and I'm sure you have in a variety of ways, and if and what what kind of do you ever have a student object to what you to, to what you've just said? You know, actually, I don't typically get that personal in my classes. In part, oh, I, I okay. see philosophy as a, right. um, I'm happy to get, I mean, I, it, there might be times where I've edged, edged in that direction in my classes. But, um, you know, philosophy is, a, it's an enterprise where you kind of need to hold lightly a little bit to um, your convictions in order to explore them with a kind of lightness and joy and let, mm. let alternative positions, give them the run for their money, maybe even mm. take that side in a debate um, mm -hmm. with, you know, and, um, and I, I want my classes to be a place where, you know, it's sort of like all these ideas can come into the conversation. None of them are going to be right. prejudged. And so, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not, I don't try to hide my convictions, but I also don't lead with them um, mm -hmm. typically uh, because, you know, I, yeah, I think it, it, it helps to kind of enter into this kind of more exploratory ethos. Um, and so if someone challenged that, you know, of course, I'd probably start by trying to just understand their challenge and asking them questions and, um, and really seeing where it's coming from. Likely, there'd be many points of challenge, you know, and in a philosophy class, we'd probably have to bracket some of them and choose one and say, well, let, let's explore this one. You know, this is an interesting mm -hmm. idea. You know, this, may, may, I don't know, suppose it was, well, someone might say, you know, I think it's actually very um, debasing to think that there is this kind of uh, God that we owe allegiance to and that we should worship, you know, may, maybe it's more empowering to just think that there's nothing, there's no higher power out there that we need to answer to, you know, to be on our own, the kind of um, existential faith of making our own way. And that's more beautiful, you know, and well, that would be something really interesting to test. And there might be some merit to that um, mm -hmm. contention, you know, and so I think we'd want to explore it and find what, where, where our, where our intuitions differ, what experiences we have that have caused us to have different views, say, of the merits of an attitude of, of worship yes. or a posture of worship. You know, these are the, the beautiful thing about philosophy is you don't really have to settle the question. The, the aim isn't exactly to convince people. The aim is to really uh, get a lot clearer on the merits of these different ideas. And so those sorts of challenges are welcome. They're part of the, the whole point in some sense. Indeed, indeed. Oh, tremendous, tremendous. Let's, uh, John, we have a... Uh, 15, well, 12 minutes or so, so as things cross your mind, and uh, this is kind of a free-flowing conversation, as you have probably guessed thus far, where, where I'm just shooting shooting at you. Let me let me throw throw another uh, thought probe uh, at you. You, you uh, in the spring of last year, about a course, uh, Theological Predication and Divine Attributes. I'm just when I'm looking at the various courses and just the titles just so intrigued me. <laughs> I've, been, I've been kind of a kind of a wordsmith for most of my I've made money off uh -huh. the words. But theological predication and divine attributes, does that relate to what we've just talked about a little bit? Yeah, it all relates in some way. <laughs> well, you're, you're, no. a kind person. you're a kind uh, person. I'll no, remember. that that's um that's a the course title I I might regret because I think the you know theological predication what the heck does that mean it probably scares away a lot of people who are like well if I don't even know what the course title means maybe this is course isn't for me but predication is just a fancy philosophy word for um for speech that ascribes certain properties to something or characterizes it you know so if I say Tom is a nice guy. You know, I've yeah. predicated niceness of you. I've, I've, I've characterized you as instantiating this property of niceness. So, and I've um, paid theological people, predication. I've, I've What's paid, that? I've, I've paid a lot of people to say that, so it's it, 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 it is reasonably true. <laughs> so, theological predication is really just a fancy word for talking about God. The mm. the, the speech act of of characterizing God in a certain way. 
And then divine attributes is this question of, you know, was, supposing there is a God, you know, should God exist? What is God like? And um, I put both in there because sometimes people say, well, we say certain things about God, but we shouldn't understand that speech as exactly illuminating to us what God is like. Um, there's certain things that are appropriate to say of God, but we can't really capture God with our mind, you know. So it would be a mistake when we say God is wise or God is powerful to kind of put the notion of wise that we have in our head that we've gained from the world and, and think of God in those terms, you know, maybe mm -hmm. it's appropriate because it's kind of getting it the right direction, but, um, but then, yeah. And then divine attributes is just this question of, you know, supposing there's a God, should there be a God? What is God like? How should we think about God? Should mm -hmm. we think of God as um, in control of everything that happens in creation? Um, or could it be reasonable to think God gives room for creation in some sense to make its own way or for there to be free agents that make their own decisions. If there are, does God know in advance everything that free creatures are going to do or might God uh, have some uncertainty about the future? Is that reasonable or does that somehow not fit with the conception of God? Um, should we think of God as having emotions as um, being angry or loving or what, you know, what would that mean in the case of God? Um, could we, harm God or is God sort of mm -hmm. floating free, not affected by the stuff that we do um, and experiencing uninterrupted divine bliss, no matter what's happening in our world. So those are the sorts of questions we look at there. And um, it's not unrelated to the question of whether God exists. Cause if you're asking that question, you might want to start to ask these further questions. Well, what sort of being am I asking about anyway, when I ask if this <laughs> being exists um, but for that class, unlike some of my classes, we get more into the does God exist question. In this one, it's just sort of, you know, supposing God exists, um, what would God be like? And what philosophical resources do we have for mm. making any progress on that question, if any? Um, what might be a, uh, a philosophical way of reflecting on the events in Memphis of the last few days? Well, man, uh, there's a very, <laughs> there's so many ways you could go with that question. Yeah, we have, we have about 10 minutes. Um, but yeah. <laughs> and I'll have you back. <laughs> um, I mean, one can't help but see that and think about evil, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what are all the factors that go into an event like this happening? Um, and, there are many social factors. Uh, there are institutional reasons. I think another question is, well, what about evil, malevolence? I mean, uh, just heart, you know, callousness. Um, uh, there's just, uh, you know, it, it opens that question about how we think of human motivation and, um, and whether it's ever reasonable and appropriate to talk about um evil is not just a, a you know byproduct of unfortunate circumstances or something but really some some kind of um genuine uh reality that we need to grapple with um i mean it um yeah i it uh I see something like that, and you know, there certainly are philosophical questions that might arise, but those aren't the first ones. The first reactions, you know, the first reaction is um, heartbreak and mm -hmm. um, anger, disappointment, um, and uh, you know, I think another question that comes up a lot in these sort of circumstances is what we owe to one another, not just as individuals, um, but as groups, as uh, people who, um, you know, you, t you, you get into issues like racial justice, and now you're thinking about, well, even if you have um, a bunch of well-intentioned people, they're dealing with legacies of injustice, inequality, and uh, even more per abhorrent, a legacy of, of slavery and utter disregard of people's humanity, you know, and that has these enduring effects. 
<laughs> and at what level are we thinking of responsibility? Is it all at the individual level or are we thinking about responsibility at these collective levels as well? Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. What what do you have an answer to that question? I mean, what what are some philosophical questions no, that it prompts I, I, for you? Uh, for for me, the, the, yeah, the, the question of evil and whether we're a species and what kind of species we are and whether we're just predators mm. that can talk. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think that whole issue we have to free, remember that we're animals. We're, we're you know higher order. Perhaps we're related. To our chimpanzees are cousins. We're just like maybe mm. bigger chimpanzees who can talk and the, the, the development of yeah. the language, but. Um, and that that's why I was so glad to, and obviously the question that I could pose to you, we we scheduled to have this conversation three three weeks ago. So Memphis, but I could have alluded to to uh, Rodney King or other things or other other episodes. So, um, and this is why for this show, my particular show on Mondays and Fridays at eleven o'clock, I'm going to be discussing these issues. Where where do we go from here as humanity, as collective individuals? Where, do we have free will? What kind of motivates you? What inspires you? What, what keeps you creative? What keeps you optimistic? What keeps you from being depressed? We can see so many um, anecdotes and ev evidences of people being despondent. Even the word dystopia. I mean, what? only like eight years ago did that word enter our consciousness? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. maybe, well, maybe for you, perhaps mm -hmm. you know, 15 years ago, but in terms of the sure. general population, we invent these words that, that are still grappling to, to express the, uh, our, our condition. And what do we, where do we go from here? What, what is, how does it affect you? So um, I've been blessed in most of my life to kind of deal with these issues and, and still make money off of it. You know, let's, let's be, let's be frank in terms mm -hmm. of communication and public relations mm -hmm. and marketing and media. But yeah, uh, that's why it was so good for me to kind of begin this, this year in January and have you kind of lay out some groundwork for folks as they listen to the show we do repeat, I repeat the shows. I'll send, I'll send the show out maybe for four or five months from now to folks that might not have tuned in today. So mm -hmm. um, it's the, the exit, the immediate existential moment is, is real. Your, your immediate reality is very real and don't, don't uh, piss it in the wind. Lastly, I would say that mm -hmm. uh, um, every day is a blessing and, uh, and it's a present, the present as well as a gift. So my mantra is every day is, is a gift, is, is, is the present reality is a gift, is, is my yeah. mantra. Yeah. And I think also any anytime there's something like that event in Memphis, a good thing to do is to reflect, um, you know, are there ways that I'm ignoring the humanity of someone who's present? Um, mm. And I mm. to, to turn introspective um, because, you know, I, I might just be doing my thing, going to work, uh, but the reality is I'm enmeshed with, in relations, economic relations, social relations yeah. with people. And sometimes that relation is just ignoring, but it's still something I'm doing. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I might be ignoring issues around me and people around me um, whose humanity is uh, I'm not honoring, you know, and so um, we can see this particularly heinous kind of represent uh, instantiation of this kind of dishonoring of someone's humanity and their value. But, um, you know, to not just see it out there, but to then turn inward and is there something that I'm doing that is an echo of that? Um, so I think that's, I don't know if that's a philosophical, I mean, it is, but it's also, I think, a just kind of religious and moral question to be indeed, indeed, seeing indeed. this as a moment for self-examination as well. Yeah, that, that, that internal reflection and turning it in, into action is, is so key. John, we have we have about uh, 30 more seconds, so I want to give you, I mean, what you just said was kind of the last word, but I want to give you another, an addendum to your, to your last word, if you like, and just want to really thank you again for spending the time with me. Yeah, well, thank you. And I mean, I'd say if anyone's interested in this artificial intelligence stuff, they can read that article, which has some more details. And um, but we have this fundamental question, are we just machines made of carbon and cells? Or are we something more? And, um, and that's a, a deep question. It's going to be one that's with us for a long time. And it, it's going to be, be urgently important, we should all be thinking about it. Um, and, and, and being ready to, to to face these questions we have about how these machines should play in our, our role, what role they should play in our lives. So 
Harry's going to play, and I pre, Harry's going to play the music. So, but I'm going to push the envelope a little bit. Where does that impulse come from your standpoint, John? This is kind of a question that unfair to me asked at the end of the show. But where does that impulse come for us to kind of create these additional, this artificial to, to create machines? Where do you think that that impulse mm. comes for us to kind of go down this path of creating weapons of mass destruction of, of creating uh, uh, artificial things? What's 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 your theory about that? Well, I think it's pretty amazing that we can do that, you know, and there's a lot of good that artificial intelligence can do. And sometimes we have these very practical motivations, um, you know, running our computers better, our economy better, mm. logistics and companies better. But really, mm. you know, human beings love creating things and solving problems. And mm. uh, in that respect, we're amazing creatures. Um, mm. And so, you know, I, I think that there's a lot to celebrate about this kind of amazing advent of artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. It's not, but even even if there's a lot of worries that it raises as well. So we'll do the celebration rather than doomsday. Focus. We'll ce we'll celebrate on, on on focus on the celebration. John, thank you so much. Sounds good. Thank it was a so pleasure much. talking to you, Tom. Good talking to you. Hope to see you soon. As I got another rhyme, another rhythm for y'all to listen I'm never quitting on my mission, I'ma roll with what I'm giving Got some ambition, this new edition, filling positions Looking at the void in myself and feeling what's missing Better watch the way you're going, better go in the right direction In the moment you stressing, but you gon' be counting blessings And I know that for certain, keep on working, open curtains Haters swerving, cause they ain't ready for your final version Whoa. I'm never gon' give up, give up Fall down, I just gotta get up, get up, yeah Cause this is my road Let's camera action, I'm ready to go I'm never gonna give up, give up Fall down, I just gotta get up, get up, yeah.